Uh, as we transition to the topic I wanted to discuss here with you today, I wanted to let you know that today is not going to be a typical uh, sermon or a typical message. And uh, the reason for that is, well, usually what we do is we do either a passage of the Scripture and we unpack that, or we take a particular topic that we feel the church needs to have heard or have addressed, and then we unpack that from multiple places of Scripture. Uh, what we're going to do today is a little different, and the reason for that is because I was asked by some of the pastors to share um, uh, about our trip to Uganda and South Sudan. Um, my wife Irina and I and the team from, from Sacramento and, and, and Europe and Carolinas went. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the observations, some of the things we saw God was doing there. And then I want to I uh, come back and, and, and share four convictions or four um, truths that I have gotten out of the trip, and I wanted to share with you as a reminder that I believe the Lord is calling us to. So a little bit unusual today, a little bit more uh, uh, focus on, on, on some of the background and, and, and history of the trip. So if you're here for the first time, um, this is not the norm, but once in a while we feel like it's exciting to see how God's working in different areas, and so this is one of those days where we get to share uh, get to share with you. So uh, I want to show you a photo of uh, the map of Africa, right? Uh, and uh, I found a cool little website where you can highlight in different colors, different countries. And so there are three countries that are highlighted in three different colors here. One is in red, and that's Sudan. Uh, and then you have uh, South Sudan in yellow, and you have Uganda in green. And so uh, we're going to talk about each of those three countries today, and you're going to see how it's all tied in together. So we're going to start with Sudan, the country that's in, in red. So Sudan is a country in northeast Africa. It has a population of 45 million people, and uh, it is the third largest country uh, by size in Africa. So it's big. You can see that from the map. It's, it's very large. And What's interesting is 91% of the population of Sudan is Muslim. So 91%, a lot, 9 out of 10 people um, are, are followers of Islam. Now, 5.4% 5, 5 uh, statistically are Christian, and that includes Orthodox Christians, right? So 5.4%. And out of those uh, evangelical Christians like us, uh, is about 2.5%. So the country is very much Muslim, very much followers of Islam there, and very small portion of, of uh, evangelical Christians there. In fact, as you would imagine, with that kind of disparity, it's very hard to be a Christian in Sudan right now. And you will also see why in a few minutes. But in 2023, Sudan was voted... Uh, was rated as the world's top 10. So it's in the top 10 places that are hardest for Christians to live in in the world. So Sudan is, is it, it's, it's down there with, with countries like North Korea and, and, and others where it's very difficult to be a follower of Jesus. It's very dangerous to be a follower of Jesus. Now, I've mentioned that Sudan is the third largest country in, in Africa, but it actually was the largest country in Africa until recently. It was the largest country until 2011, when what happened is the, the country of Sudan was split into two, into Sudan and South Sudan. And that's where that space in yellow on the map comes, comes from. So before the red and the yellow was all one country, in 2011, it was, it was split up. And what happened is that original country was the northern part was very much Muslim and the southern part was majority Christian. And so a lot of, a lot of wars, a lot of issues. And then finally, in fact, war was always a, a, a part of their history. Two years, about 70 years ago, uh, two years after they gained their independence from Egypt and Britain, what happened is two years after they got that independence, 
what happened is a civil war started. Civil war started. And it continued on and off. It would stop for a year or two and then it would start up again. It would stop a little bit. It would start up again. In fact, out of the 70-some years of history of that country since they got that independence, 46-plus years were spent in civil war. Think about it. 46 out of the 70 years is full of war. Now, our church is, is home to many refugees and immigrants from Ukraine and Russia and, and other, other places. And we know that the, the latest active phase of the conflict has been, has been happening for the past couple of years. And it's been really tough. It's really difficult. So much destruction, so much pain, so much war. But now, imagine 46 years of that. You have two or three generations of people growing up in that kind of environment. Really, really tough. Two out of three years, you would experience civil war. So what happened in 2005 is that a peace treaty was signed. And in 2011, with the help of United Nations, they, this country was split into two. Sudan and South Sudan. Sudan remained predominantly Muslim and South Sudan was mostly Christian. So finally, all the people all over the world said, well, finally, now there is not going to be much war. Now there is not going to be much conflict. It's just Christians living together. It's going to be no big deal, right? <laughs> not, not really. <laughs> what happened is two years after Sudan or, um, was split up and after South Sudan became its own country, two years after that, um, the president and the vice president uh, did not agree on who is going to be in power, uh, accused each other of insurrection. One tried to kill the other. Uh, each one had an army. Next thing you know, civil war breaks out. So again, a lot of wartime, a lot of destruction. And in April of 2023, which is a year ago, it got even worse with hundreds of thousands of people running away from war, running away from famine, running away from poverty, from this violence and from hunger. And United Nations estimated that in United Nations estimated that in 2023, 7 million people in South Sudan don't have basic food and live in poverty. 7 million people. In fact, UN ranked South Sudan as one of the countries with the lowest literacy rates in the world. What that means is less than 35% of people can read and write. One out of three people can read and write. One out of three people, the way they tested it, is one out of three people were able to write a simple paragraph about their everyday life and read it and comprehend it. Less than a third. And that was like a 7 or 8% improvement from the previous census. More than half of the children in South Sudan in 2016, which is when the statistic was calculated, were not in school. They couldn't go to school, either too far, or it's destroyed, or there is a war going on, or they have to uh, feed their family and help and help survive. It's especially bad for girls. Girls, less than 1% of girls in South Sudan receive formal education. Less than 1% statistically. So it's all about survival. So what do they do? Once it got really bad, what happened is all the people, all, all the people in that yellow area, once the civil war broke out again, they ran. They went somewhere where it was safer and more stable. And where is that? Well, that's the third country on that map. That's Uganda in green. And so northern part of Uganda, the country that's shown in green on the screen, that became home for a lot of the refugee camps, a lot of the people who are, who are settling in there and living in tents and living in, uh, in, in, in terrible conditions, waiting, trying to figure out what's going to happen in South Sudan over there. Are we going to be able to go home or is it going to be war? And in fact, there is uh, uh, an election scheduled for December 2024 and everybody's trying to see is it going to blow up politically again or is it going to kind of become stable and people can start moving back? Will it bring more fighting and destruction or will it stabilize and some people will be able to return? 
So that's where we went. We went to northern part of Uganda in that green area, and we've crossed the border into South Sudan, ministering in those churches and in some of the, uh, in the hospital there that I'll tell you a little bit uh, in, just, in just a minute. In Uganda, by the way, there is more than one million refugees right now that are living from South Sudan. More than a million people. And just one refugee camp that we visited, I'll mention in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in a minute, uh, the, the Bidi Bidi camp, it's 270,000 people living in one place. 270,000 people. So what do we do there? Well, there are some different areas of focus. And one, uh, one, one slide that will show you that is all of those areas. So pastor's training, we'll tell you about that. Ministry in refugee camps, children's ministry, uh, medical team, women's ministry, and relationship and partnership building is what we kind of focused on. So let's talk about pastor's uh, training. Well, before we talked about pastor's training, let's keep that slide there for a second. So um, you, you see that bus right there, and I'll, I'll refer back to it in just a minute. That bus uh, traveled in places I didn't think was possible. We pretty much drove on these kinds of roads where uh, in, in northern part of Uganda, where there is, there is no pavement, there is no rock, no gravel, no asphalt. It was, it was pretty much a, a, a path where people either walked or rode motorcycles on. Motorcycles are very, very common there uh, because gas is as expensive here pretty much. It's very, very pricey. And so uh, we were crossing the small river, the stream, and uh, I thought we were going to get stuck. But uh, they asked us to dismount. We all left the bus and we, we, we crossed we cross there. So uh, if you look on top of the bus, that's how all of our luggage was stored. You pretty much tie it on top of the roof and uh, just pray it doesn't fall off. And uh, at this point, we probably need new luggage because it was pretty much destroyed uh, during those, those couple of weeks. So what do we do there? Um, if we look at the next slide, the pastor's training that we did there, um, we conducted three pastor's conferences. That was one of my, my primary involvements there is, is, is discipleship of, of pastors. And you can see on this photo, well, first of all, on the photo on the bottom, that's a discipleship center that uh, one of the missions that we went with over there has built. This is a building where people come and get trained up and have these conferences, these training sessions. It's a, it's a blessing. It's, it's pretty new, got built just a couple of years ago. But the most common way of, of gathering is right there under a mango tree. Lots of mangoes. Super hot, um, there is no AC because there's no electricity anywhere, no running water, no indoor plumbing, nothing like that. And so people just gather under a, a, a mango tree and then that's, that's us doing some training over there with pastors from the local area. So we did a three-day pastor's conference. We did two one-day pastor's trainings. And overall, about 120 pastors were trained during the time that we were there. 120 pastors. Now... It sounds like a lot. I, I just want you to understand something. The country started up in 2011, right? The whole country formed in 2011. And in 2011, the first Baptist church of South Sudan was formed. There were no Baptist churches in South Sudan prior to that. And so we're talking about a very young generation of, of believers, particularly Baptists, right? We're talking about a very young generation of, of, of evangelical Christians. And so these people are very young. They're very much uh, uh, inexperienced, but they're hungry for God's word. They're hungry for the gospel and for the authority of the word. And that was very, very impressive to see. So that's the first thing we, we did. The second thing we focused on is the refugee camps. Now, as I said, the war that started in 2017 uh, displaced uh, over a million people. And uh, Bidi Bidi camp, 270,000 people living in different huts and tents. Just so that you understand the scope of the problem. They get five kilograms of food per person per month. Do some math. They get four kilograms of corn flour and one kilogram of beans per person per month. That's it. 
So um, we've, uh, we've given you guys an opportunity to give some money for food as we traveled there. And we bought a total of three trucks, but two of the trucks were brought to this camp, this refugee camp that's extremely large. And what you see there is an actual photo. We didn't just get it from the internet. All the photos you see here are actual photos that we took during this trip. And these are the kids who are super excited to get some of that corn flour and some of, that, some of those beans. Uh, I don't know about you and your kids, but I wish my kids were that unpicky about the food they ate, right? Uh, it's, it, they were glad, they were joyful because somebody came and served them. And it was just a, such a basic necessity and it was a blessing. So it was, um, it was a, a testimony of extreme poverty. But friends, I want you to know there is also an extreme opportunity. When, when, when there are these different situations like that, there are difficult situations, God also gives extreme opportunities. Think about it. This camp, there were over 60 Baptist churches formed during this period of time. 60. Because all these people are in one place, and they've come, and they're living in these refugee camps, and, and you have an opportunity to go, and you start churches, you plant churches, you train people, and then over time, they're going to go back into their country once situation stabilizes, and they're going to be able to plant more churches. And so this is an opportunity to reach people for Christ. A wonderful opportunity. Uh, another area of focus was children's ministries. Now, uh, I, children's ministry is, is, is not my strongest suit, but I had an opportunity to, uh, to preach and, and, and pray. And, and uh, you see um, uh, these photos from some of this ministry. The bottom photo in that big uh, hat, that's me. I, I don't remember what I was showing kids, but they were clearly engaged. They wanted to see what was going on. And then the upper uh, photo, it's actually a, a Christian school that I didn't understand it at that time, but that's considered a very high-end school, okay? They all have uniforms, everything is clean, they have, they have bathrooms there and big buildings. It was, uh, it was impressive. Uh, it wasn't at the time, but then when I saw what else is out there, uh, I kind of got a reality check. And so uh, we had an opportunity to preach the gospel to, to these children. Uh, I want you to also understand that the scale is, is just enormous. The need is, is huge. 920 children showed up in one day for a children's program. So where is our children's minister director, Olena? I know 160 is a lot, 180 maybe now. 200? 200. But we have a ways to go, okay? 920. <laughs> 920 kids. It was a lot, and and uh, it was it was just uh, just a wonderful opportunity to uh, to serve them. Uh, 29 kids repented just during that first half of the day when we'd given them an opportunity, and they have these basic needs of food and clothing and just just very basic things. They don't need a lot. They just need the basic need met. So medical team uh, was another area of ministry uh, for us. And uh, uh, we have some photos over here. And um, this is in South Sudan. So this is us crossing the border from Uganda to South Sudan. And uh, they have no technicians, no x-ray machines. There is no specialists of any kind. Um, uh, and they have an emergency room. What you're looking at is an emergency room. It's basically a tent full of mold, pretty much empty. Uh, and... Uh, no plumbing, no running water, because they, every morning they have to go and bring water in. And so the medication is primarily provided by a nonprofit called Doctors Without Borders. If it wasn't for them, this hospital wouldn't, wouldn't survive. Now, you might think this is probably in some small village, middle of nowhere. This is the largest hospital in the county. All right? So this is the largest, this is a county regional center kind of thing. So by God's grace, they, I think they were finishing up uh, a more permanent building at that time. So it will look better, hopefully, uh, in the near future. But, but that's what it looked like when we were over there. Uh, the next area was women's ministry. Now, women's ministry was something unexpected. Um, I was preparing for the trip. I knew what I was going to preach on and, and the, the, the seminars that I was going to teach on. Well, when we showed up to uh, one of the areas... 
uh, the, the local leader said, well, our women would love to hear, you know, your wives and sisters, you know, uh, what they have to say to us. And, and uh, we've gathered a few women. Well, a few women ended up being like 120. And so they ended up doing two women's conferences there. And uh, my wife, who is not a very public speaker kind of person, I think she's got a gift for a couple of days. And, and her and the sisters there, they ended up uh, teaching these women. And God was at work because several days later, we started receiving phone calls from the pastors who were at the pastor's conference. And they said, we don't know what you did with our wives, but they came home and they like repented. They asked us for forgiveness. They asked our kids for forgiveness. So whatever was happening there, God was at work. Super, super, super exciting. And uh, like I said, over 120 women uh, were trained there. So last but not least, relationships were formed and some partnerships were established. Uh, there are some organizations that were represented on this trip. Uh, uh, one of the brothers who was there was uh, uh, Willie Diker. He is from Germany and uh, he is from International Evangelism Association. Uh, it's an organization that's been um, uh, associated with Billy Graham Association and uh, the heavy focus on discipleship. And they've been going there for many years, and it's, it's, been, it's been a blessing. Um, uh, Vili Duke uh, uh, or Vili Dick uh, was also there from Newfields Ministries. Uh, you know that brother, he's come out here and, and taught some seminars on, on counseling here at GNC. And so he was there, and, 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 and his organization supports this, um, this work for, for many years as well. So Edward Dima, uh, that's um, the African brother who lives there, who is the leader of the, uh, the Baptist Association of South Sudan. Uh, very trustworthy brother who's been, uh, who's been working uh, with these organizations for many, many years. And uh, uh, it's just a big blessing because he knows the need. He knows the local churches. And they do, they do a really, really good, good work. So that's kind of an overview. By the way, that's a photo of an actual refugee village that you see. Uh, they built these houses uh, out of mud. That's what they do. They, they don't have money for concrete or bricks. So what they do is they take mud and they form bricks out of mud, and then they uh, start fires in, so from both sides, and they burn these bricks, and these bricks uh, form the walls of, of, these, of these huts. Uh, there is no furniture inside, sleeping on the floor, like I said, very, very basic, just protection from sun, wind, and, and rain kind of thing. So that's an overview of, of where we've gone. There were amazing moments of how God was working. But the question I guess I wanted to ask and share with you some thoughts is what do we do with all that? How does that apply to us, right? And so what I, what I wanted to share with you is that the world has really shrunk over the past several hundred years. Now, physically, the world hasn't changed, right? It's the same earth, the same globe. That hasn't changed. But the it became a lot more accessible. When Apostle Paul traveled the countries in the Mediterranean, when he went and visited churches around the, the Mediterranean Sea, what happens is he spent pretty much all of his life just working that one area. And sometimes he arrived at these places on a shipwreck because the ship crashed. Sometimes he would arrive to these churches bitten by snakes. It was very, very rough kind of travel. It took a long time. The missionaries of an early church, uh, an Apostle Paul, and even a couple of hundred years ago, they could not possibly imagine that you could hop on a plane and in less than 24 hours you could be at any point of the earth and you could minister to pretty much any group of people within a day or two. And your worst suffering will be a jet lag <laughs> oh, and, 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 and maybe a little bit of lack of sleep and maybe some turbulence. It's hard to imagine such opportunities to share the gospel. And so I came back with some convictions and some reminders. There were four of them that I wanted to briefly share with you that I took out of this trip. And I, and I pray that it will be beneficial to you. And here is the first one. The first conviction or reminder was the urgency of the Great Commission. 
the urgency of Great Commission. You see, none of us here, if every believer I know, you say, well, should we share the gospel? Everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, we should share the gospel. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in five years. And then you ask people if they have shared the gospel with anybody, and they'll say, oh, yeah, not, not this week. But friends, I, I walked away from this trip with this sense of urgency for the Great Commission. It is urgent, and it is something that we should not delay and push back. We must, as a church, come back over and over again to the vision and mission of the church. Because it is so easy for us to lose sight of what that mission is. As the church grows, as we get more people involved, as we start this ministry and that ministry, and as we start doing all the wonderful things, they're great. They're great things. But they're not the primary things. They're not the things that we must focus on for, uh, at the expense of sharing the gospel, at the expense of spreading the good news. And the danger is that the leaders of these ministries are in danger of forgetting why they're doing it. You see, all these programs and all these things, they really exist for one of two purposes, to glorify God and to share the gospel. They're not there for our own comfort. They're not there so that we could feel smarter and more educated. They're not there just for us uh, to feel good about ourselves. They're not there for us in, in any shape or form. It is there for us to worship God and to spread the good news, to literally make disciples. And we're going to see uh, that in just a few minutes. If just because it keeps us busy doesn't mean that that directly helps the mission of the church. And so the challenge to all of us, and especially leaders of ministries, right, and especially deacons and pastors and everybody who is dreaming of being involved actively in ministry, uh, it is extremely important for us to be able to answer the question of how is what I'm doing today, how is this ministry, how is this work directly contributing to the mission of the church? How is it moving the mission of the church forward? Now, what is the mission of the church? Well, uh, it is to acquire and disciple joyful and mature children of God who build up the church and impact the world for Christ. Years ago, we have formulated this. It actually sounds a little better in Russian, I think, but, uh, but, but it gets the point across. It's to acquire and disciple joyful and mature children of God who build up the church and impact the world for Christ. Now, this statement is based on two things out of the Bible. Two things. The Great Commission and the Great Commandment. If you were to look at every part of this statement, you would see that it's in some way connects to the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Now, what is the Great Commission? The Great Commission is written in, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." Our mission is to make disciples. Our mission is to share the gospels and make disciples. And we make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them to observe all the things they need to observe. That's the great commission. Now, the great commandment or the first commandment, the most important commandment is written in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What this is saying is that if we took all of the Bible and condensed it together to just two things, we would get the great commission and the great commandment. We would get very simply, love God, love people, make disciples. That's our mission. That's why we exist. Love God or glorify God, love people, and make disciples. That's it. 
Now, many people mistakenly think that Jesus came on this earth and, and he just came to die and he did nothing uh, from the time that he was born or during the years of his ministry until that happened. That is not true. Jesus had a mission for his ministry on this earth before he died, before he went on the cross. It's written in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see, gospel is what Jesus shared. He was telling them the good news before he went and died on the cross. He was telling them about the gospel of God. And the gospel is the foundation of everything we do. It must be the foundation of every ministry, every event, and every project. And every single one of us must be able to say, how is what I'm doing directly contributing to the mission of the church? How does it glorify God? How is it expressing my love for people? How is it helping us make disciples? That's our mission. Now, there are some ways that are more direct, and there are some ways you have to think about it. How does it contribute? How does it help? You know, some people might say, well, our cafe is not making disciples. And I would say it's a great opportunity, a platform for us to be able to connect with people in fellowship and actually fulfill one of the purposes of the church. So, so you got to be able to think through those things. How does it connect to the mission of the church? Now, I want to share with you that there are many, 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 many things that I was super excited and encouraged by during this trip. But there are some things that were a little depressing. And there are some things that were a little discouraging. And one of those things was, you know, you're seeing all this poverty. You're seeing all this destruction. You're seeing the levels of existence that are they're just, just hard to understand until you see it. I'll share this with you. I didn't share it at the, the first service. But, I mean, girls don't go to school because they don't have a girl's bathroom. So when they go through their period, they don't have a place to change and they don't have access to sanitary napkins in order to be able to stay in school. So they stay home for a week and a half. I mean, that's the kind of reality they live in. We sponsored as a group one of the bathrooms to be built in for girls for one of the schools that we visited there. And so it's actually, they're working on it right now. The, the, the parents got, united, got together and we were able to buy some materials for them in order to do that. It's, it's, it's just crazy. And so you're looking at all this extreme need. You're seeing all this poverty and you're thinking, Lord, you could spend so much money here. And what can we individually and what can we as a church, as a, maybe even association of churches, what is it that can we do that would even make a difference? So I looked it up. I was wondering how much aid goes into Africa on an annual basis. Like how much money actually gets, gets, gets put into that economy. And somebody calculated it, $53 billion dollars in 20, is it 22 or 23, got 2023, 20, got contributed there. 53 billion with a B. And it looks like it barely made a dent. It looks like there is so much more that needs to be done. It looks like it is not enough. So how can we, as a, as a small church with a small budget, and this church is made up of many refugees, like I said, from, from a Slavic uh, side of things to other areas, and people are just starting their life in the United States and trying to, to support their families. How can we, with our limited resources, limited incomes, even, even make a difference? And the answer is, you focus on the gospel and you focus on discipleship. The Great Commission must be the mission of the church when you're doing that because there are two very simple reasons for that. The first reason is that there is something worse than death. There is something worse than poverty. There is something worse, as terrible as it sounds, than going hungry at night. And then there is something better than having all those things. There is something better than living in the in, uh, in United States, one of the richest nations of the world, and having all the basic needs met. What is it? Well, the something worse refers to eternity in hell without God. Luke 12, 4, 5 says this, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after they have nothing more than they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. 
Fear, who, fear him who after he has killed has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. There is something worse than not having those things. There is something worse than dying. Spending eternity in hell. But there is something better than getting all your basic needs, net, uh, basic needs met. Those things are important, but there is something far better. And it's to spend eternity in the presence of God, enjoying his eternal presence forever and ever within the riches of his grace. Psalm 1611 says this, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We may not be able to solve the poverty issue of Africa, but we absolutely can and should share the gospel and should make disciples because that's what we're called to do. And it's not just about the wells or of water that need to be dug. It's about people going through their trials and, and having their, their, test faith, uh, their faith tested. They're testing their faith right now. And they're at this infancy of, of their faith. Like I said, these churches, they're just starting up. Uh, the first Baptist church of South Sudan was founded in 2011. It has planted 53 churches since then. 53 churches since then. Because people are hungry for God. In the same way the former Soviet Union in the early 90s was open to the gospel, that's what we're seeing is happening in those countries right now. So... The first thing is the urgency of the Great Commission. We should not push it back into some undefined time in the future. The second thing is I just want to uh, share with you that the power of love, of loving actions, is just, is just unbelievable. They're so receptive in, in listening and accepting and listening to those things you want to share with them because they know that you're there to serve them and you've come from across the world and you don't need anything from them. You're there to share the good news with them. They appreciate it. Now, one of the villages we visited, in fact, that photo of the, of the bus going from the, from, the, uh, from the hill, one of the villages we visited, uh, after we, the bus crossed, we all walked next to the bus, and the people who were waiting for us, they were waiting to do a service with us there. And they, they realized we kind of got stuck. And so they came out of the village and greeted us. And they were singing and dancing in front and behind the bus, just rejoicing that we came and visited them. Just being glad, just being joyful. And as I walked into that village, I looked to the left, and there was a well there. And that well is, is everything's needed. There is no running water. Everything depends on water. So every morning, the women from each different village, they, they, they get these big cans of water. They put it on their heads, and, and they walk to these wells. They, they pump this water, and they carry it back. That's how they wash laundry. That's how they cook. That's how they clean anything. That, everything has to be brought in like that. And so as I walked into this village, there is a well on the left. And as I found out, that well was built by one of the churches from Germany. They got together. They put their money together. They built this well. And out of that area, this, this kind of regional center formed. And then there was a church planted. And all the people from the neighborhood places, they come. And now this place has water. They met their need. It was a simple thing. Yes, it took a little bit of money, but it was a simple need that they, that they met. And then I look on the right, and I was blown away. Again, they're building a church, right? And we look at this church, and it's got the walls. It doesn't have yet the roof. And, and I find out what's the story with that. And they're telling me that this is the third time they're rebuilding this church. And the reason they're rebuilding this church is because they have no cement, they have no money for that, and they're building everything out of bricks, and the bricks are burned, so they're a little bit more solid, but the mud that they connect the bricks with, they can't burn that, right? And so they build, they build, they build, and if they haven't had the time to put the roof on the building, when this tropical rain comes in, it washes everything away. So all the walls just fall down. And they remake those bricks again, and they rebuild it again. And so for the second time, and again the rain came. And when we were over there, they were on their third, third attempt with, with putting this building in place where they can worship. Because the rain just washes it away. It's made out of mud. 
So we were able to secure some materials for them and they put that roof on that building so that they don't have to rebuild it the fourth time. Simple thing. Can you help with the roof? Nothing fancy. They didn't care about Calvinism or Armenianism. They didn't care about eschatology uh, of when Jesus is going to show up. They didn't care about the finer points of whether you should do this or that. They just wanted to have, how do I live my day tomorrow with Jesus? They're a young generation of believers. One of the questions was, uh, Pastor, uh, we live in a Muslim area. There's a lot of Muslims here. They're rich, and uh, they come for our daughters, and they offer us a bunch of goats uh, when they ask them to marry them, and we're just tempted to let them marry our kids because it's it's a lot of goats now goats are a big thing over there right it's just you eat a lot very tasty by the way <laughs> very good so you you might laugh at it and say well what's the big big deal with goats goats are you know yeah that doesn't apply to us but you know what though i'm seeing refugees and immigrants from Russia, Ukraine, and other countries, they come over here and they spend all of their time at work running their business. They don't serve. They don't spend time with their family. They don't spend time with God. And you know what? You have the same choice as these people. Do you sell out for a bunch of goats? And sadly, many of you choose goats. That's the reality they live in. That's the reality of what they have to decide every single day. They just want to know more about Jesus. So, again, the urgency of the Great Commission, the power of basic, practical things, love and action. The third thing I want to share with you is the impact of discipleship. Listen, it is very, very intentional. When, when we've uh, had a call, uh, an altar call, we had, a, we had an opportunity for people to repent at that school. And like I said, 29 kids during that first half a day, they raised their hands and we prayed for them, praise God. Uh, and then the, the pastor, uh, the pastor of, that, of that school came out and said, okay, everybody who has uh, raised up their hand before, go ahead and raise them up again. Something we probably wouldn't do here, right? Makes people uncomfortable. So they raised up their hands, and he took a notepad, he took a pen, and he would come up to each one and said, what sin did you repent of? How is your life going to be different? What does the gospel mean to you? And then he would write down his name, he would write down his information, and he would pray for him right there on the spot, and he would go to the next one. And we, we waited until he goes around to all of the 29 kids who have repented that time. And then by the end of that day, all of those kids were in a small group preparing for baptism. Now that's intentional discipleship. I learned from that. That was a humbling moment. That was incredible. You know, you come over there to teach them, but the reality is they're teaching you through living it out practically in, our, in their everyday life. Friends, making disciples is our mission. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's your job. That's my job is to share the gospel with a person who is capable of sharing it with another person. First Baptist Church of South Sudan planted 53 churches since 2011. Since 2011, in just 12 or 13 years. That's incredible. And you feel sorry for them. The reality is they should feel sorry for us. Chasing our goats. Focusing on the things that don't matter. The fourth thing I want to share with you in conclusion is to rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Listen, there were times when I'm looking at these people, I'm thinking they have nothing. They're broke, they're dirty, they're hungry, they're poor, they have no access to information. Two out of three cannot read. It's just, it's just a terrible, terrible situation. I could show you more photos of the living conditions that will make your hair stand up. On, it's just, just crazy. But you know what, though? They're full of joy. 
They're full of joy in Jesus because they trust him every day. They rely on him every day, and they come to him with prayer that's not just, Lord, bless this food, blah, thank you for everything, amen, and go to sleep. To them, it's real. An average age of a man in that area is between 35 and 40 years of age. They don't, have, they, they don't know how long they're going to live. It's very unsanitary, medical issues. They die young. They don't know how long they're going to live. So they really do trust on the Lord to provide for them every single day. There are no records, by the way. They, they don't know how, how, how old they are in, many, in, in smaller villages. What happens is, is uh, uh, Edward Dima, the, the gentleman that was guiding us there, one of their leaders, he, he doesn't know how old he is. He says, I think I'm about 50, I'm not sure, uh, and uh, there is no birth certificates, there is no passports, they, he, he said, my parents are dead, I don't know when I was born. Many kids are like that. When we were separating them out into sports programs, playing soccer with each other, what happened is they don't know how old they are, so you look at them by height and you say, okay, you're about 10, you're about 12, you guys split up. That's the reality they live in, and that's the reality through which they depend on Jesus Christ every single day. So my prayer for all of us here today is that we would remember these four things. That the Great Commission is urgent. And maybe today when you get home, maybe tomorrow when you go to work or you go to school, you have an opportunity to share the good news with somebody and live it out in your life. And that, listen, you don't have to do grand things, but the little things, meeting needs with love, those things speak volumes. They're wonderful things that testify of your love for God and for people. The discipleship component. You might think that you need to have a PhD or go to a seminary to disciple somebody. That is not true. This trip was a reminder for me of that. There are people who just can't read. If you can read, you're highly educated to them. And you have a Bible. That's a plus. That's, that's amazing. You're doubly educated. So now you are qualified to disciple them. You're qualified. But in order to do that, you must spend time in the Word yourself. And last but not least is to rejoice always. It was a great reminder how our heart tends to grumble whenever we're inconvenienced or whenever something doesn't go our way. But these are the people who are going through hardships that most of us would, would consider crazy, but they're filled with joy and peace with God. So I pray that that would be the kind of thing that would be happening in our church. And uh, as of right now, we've, we started the conversation with the elders, how our church can come alongside and meet some of those needs. And so we're praying about it and we're talking about it. And I really hope that our church can participate in some way in, um, in, in sharing the gospel with people there in uh, Uganda and South, South Sudan. Amen? Let us stand and pray.